Perfect. Awesome. Hello, everyone. Thanks. Thank you for joining. Um, this is our fifth, I think, adventure in deep learning using TensorFlow. My name is George Soto. I'm uh, one of the co-organizers of Deep Learning Adventures, a community that um, discovers deep learning topics. We go over them together. We go over code together. We learn new things about deep learning and how to uh, apply them in interesting challenges. Um, if you haven't visited our meetup, um, you can go to meetup.com, Deep Learning Adventures. We have uh, previous meetups that we attended, uh, today's session, uh, which is on transfer learning and multi-class uh, classification. Um, next week, we have a happy hour as well as a trivia night. I was trying to keep the trivia night today, but we added a little bit of extra content that I think we're going to run out of time. So I just moved it for next week. Hopefully, that won't ruin the happy hour too, too badly. <laughs> um, then that would conclude course number um, three, I believe. Uh, no, course number two, sorry. Then we'd move on to course number three and four. The specialization that we're taking has four uh, courses. So with that said, let's dive in and present. Um, I added this, sli this slide on our presentation. The presentation is on our Meetup page about uh, convolutions. Um, it's an animation of um, how does convolution work. Um, it, I was mainly thinking about a, a topic that Robert mentioned last time when he was talking about different layers and how when you're looking at deeper layers, that representation is actually a combination of of multiple filters in a previous layer. So what we're looking at here, this is a screenshot from Andrew's um, specialization on convolutions, is uh, the red, green, and blue uh, images or part of the images that you see are actually the red, green, and blue channels of an RGB image. And in this case, it's just a six by six by three um, uh, image. And we're applying a three by three by three filter. And the number of channels in the image, which is three, has to match the number of filters in our convolution here. And what, has, what effectively we're doing is <clears throat> we're applying this volume. This filter is actually a volume, same with the image. But we're applying this convolution as a volume into each patch of the image. And then depending if you're using strides or padding, um, you don't have to consider that. But let's say we start from the first you know, three by three patch, then the second one, shifted by one, then the third one, and so forth. And we calculate this four by four matrix simply because um, uh, we have this uh, regional pixels that we cannot calculate convolution for. So from six by six by three, we end up to a four by four uh, matrix. And this three convolutional filters here, you could have different filters that are looking for different features on different channels. So you could have maybe looking for, let's say vertical or horizontal lines on the red channel. You could have some other feature looking for uh, features in the, green uh, part of the image or the blue channel and so forth. And when you train a neural network, these features are, are, are learned using uh, gradient descent. That's using one uh, filter. If you have two filters, then this four by four becomes four by four by number of filters. And the last thing that you need to do to make this a convolutional layer, you need to add a bias and you need to pass this whole matrix uh, element-wise through a, a linear uh, array loop function that basically gets rid of um, all negative entries, makes them zero, and all positive entries remain as they are. So that introduces that non-linearity part here. So you, we started with a six by six by three image and we ended up with a four by four by two simply because we had two filters that we applied on. And this animation here on the right is doing the same. Um, this, let me use the pointer. So you can see better. This part here is corresponds to the, let's say the red part, the R part of the image, the green part and the blue channel. And we have two filters. Each of them will have three parts corresponding to the R and G and the B part of the image. And as you can see what they're doing is they're doing the convolution. Uh, I believe in this case, they're also applying a bias, but they're not applying any nonlinearity because you see no negative values here. But if you look at one value here, you see that it's actually a, a combination of um, different channels in the image, but also different filters. 
cool. Um, any questions or clarifications around this before we move on? I just wanted to bring it up um, based on some previous comments. Okay, cool. Then we'll talk about transfer learning this week. This is week three of course two, and um, it's an interesting topic as well as multi-class classification that Robert will cover, uh, will leave for us. Awesome. So the idea of transfer learning, uh, what is it and how does it work? Um, think of it as when you learn, you know, as humans, when we learn something new, uh, let's say we learn how to do something, we can take lessons learned from that topic and hopefully apply it to a similar topic. That's the very high level definition of transfer learning. But in terms of models and in terms of deep learning, what that means is, as you've seen, we're uh, to to fit to fit to effectively train a deep learning a deep learning network. You need a a lot of data and b a lot of processing power and very good network architecture. So it's a challenging problem, not especially back in the days when everybody could afford to do it. That's why you know you could see this in research papers and then later on in in big companies, you know, like like tech companies could apply this simply because they have the data and also the the infrastructure to do this. But let's say um, we wanted we wanted to, to use some other models. You know, how do we do that? And the idea is simple. You you let somebody you use somebody else's model. Let you know. Let in this case, um, a researcher spend you know weeks training their model, fine tuning it, and it's state of the art in terms of let's say image classification. And they release their model uh, open source for others to use and uh, improve on. But that. What that gives us is the flexibility to use that model, download it. We have the, the option to what is called freeze some of the previous layers. Let's, let's let me use the pointer again. Um, the image, the input image is again from the beginning here, traversing all these different layers and then uh, coming down to these two outputs. And what we're effectively doing is we're actually freezing the previous layers and we're probably going to take, take out the existing last layer or last few layers from the model simply because our data set might be slightly different. And we're going to fine tune it, meaning we're going to train just these few last layers on our specific task. So for example, here, a high level example is maybe there was a state of the art deep learning model that was trained on detecting different vehicles, you know, cars, trucks, bicycles, and all that. And we want to fine tune it, let's say for detecting you know, delivery trucks or something else, you know, something very specific to our data set. So what that allows us to do is uh, take this model that's been pre-trained on different categories, um, use 80, 90% of, it, of its layers, um, remove the last few layers and add our, our own uh, network, which is probably, you know, a combination of what we've seen of convolutional layers, um, DNNs, you know, dense neural networks or something else. and Maybe our challenge is smaller than the original challenge. Maybe we can we just need to distinguish between car and a truck that is specific to our data set. So we we'll have our data flowing through this network. This pre-trained neural network would be what is called frozen and would be fine-tuning this last part using the loss function, the optimizer, and gradient descent. Um, in, a, in a 3D version of this, uh, this image just shows that you can have a very deep network that has convolutions, max pooling, convolutions, max pooling, and that has the fully connected layers in the end. When you do transfer learning, you basically take, um, let's say, 90% of your network, you remove the last top, the, the last, uh, like the top layers, and you can you have the flexibility to go as far into the network as you see here as, as you want. You don't have to go to the very last layer. You can go to the second to last, third to last, seventh to last, it's up to you. Um, then, so this is the basic high level idea. TensorFlow has um, um, a library called TFKRS applications and uh, they, there you, you'll see the code for different models, including one of them that we'll see today called Inception. So that's the high level um, idea of transfer learning. Any feedback or comments before? Do we know how, uh, how many layers Inception has? When it showed the, the summary, um, yeah. you know, he showed like, 
<laughs> like it was billions or something. Yeah, you know, there were so many that you couldn't see them. Is do we have any idea how how big that actually is? Yeah, we'll we'll say there are actually multiple versions of it. You'll see it has one of the versions I will see has twenty two layers deep. And oh, that's all. Okay, yeah, there's yeah, yeah. more than that. But it has multiple parameters because it uses a lot of what is called inception blocks. And that's just a combination of convolutional networks, max pooling. Uh, it has a lot of parameters. I think it has 21 million parameters. But yeah, it's, it's 22 layers deep. So when, when you see the summary um, that's so like long, like that, that's um, not necessarily reflecting the number of layers exactly. I, I, I thought it was before. You know, when we were looking at yeah, the, what we've seen so far, each row that you see in model dot summary is actually a layer. Um, yeah. In in this specific model, as you'll see, they have what are called modules or blocks, and that modular block could actually have three separate mm -hmm. layers in it. it. That's why it looks so long. But if you look at it from a high level view, it, it's actually twenty two. Okay. Yeah. George. Yep. The um the diagram on the lower left shows uh, with the, the new model, it's, it's picking out a, a subset of, of um, distinguishing a car from a truck. Isn't transfer, isn't this more often used for something that's quite different from what the original categories were? So um, let's say this was, the original model was trained on vehicles. Um, mm -hmm. You, I, I would imagine you can use this to detect something similar to vehicles. Like, I don't imagine you, but it, it would be your vehicle. Let's say this was like, uh, you know, general vehicles, any color, any brand, any specific one. Yours might be slightly different, but somehow, you know, uh, related uh, data set. So it could be, for example, delivery vehicles, or it could be vehicles of a specific brand. Uh, I don't think you can use this model here to do, let's say, animal detection. Like, mm -hmm. I don't think it'll work. Okay. So the, the domain has to be relative, I would say. Okay. Yeah, George, I was going to point out, you, you could do that, but it wouldn't work very well. Um, there's a paper, and I'll try to post the link into the chat from, from the TensorFlow site. There's two options for transfer with TensorFlow. One is called embedding, which is more mathematically rigorous and involves recomputation of some of the inner weights. But the one that TensorFlow recommends or uses with the TensorFlow Lite is called, uh, <clears throat> is, is the other version where you only retrain uh, the last layer and it's exactly the way you described it. It's, it's you're trying to extend a model to your specific purpose. So I'll try to post that link. It's a short article, but it's really good. Awesome. Thank you, Steve. George, I would just say that, um, <clears throat> so there's two things you pointed out. One, one is freezing and unfreezing of layers. And you can, of course, leave all the layers there if you want. Um, the other thing that you're pointing out, that the two things you're pointing out is one is usually what they call removal of the top, of, you know, removing the top of the model where you're, you're taking off layers and as you said, putting your own custom layers. And both have those, both have applications where you might want to do one or the other or a combination. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. Cool. Um, before we dive into that specific model and the specific transfer learning application, I thought it would be nice to see some other classical, what are called classical networks, just to give us an idea of how deep learning models have evolved over time and basically, um, what is which which one we'll be using today so this is more of like hey if you look back in time how did deep learning models look like and this is from andrew's uh, specialization again on convolutional neural networks um so one of them is called lenet 5 it was published in 1998 uh, by Yann lacun is it was one of the seminal papers and neural network architectures in the sense that in computer vision in the sense that it, it used uh, fairly simple to us now, but you know, innovative back in, 90, in the 90s. Network of original image, a 5x5 five five convolution of stride one, um, reduced to 28 by 28 by six, then an average pooling, another convolution, then another, another average pooling layer, followed by a fully connected layer of 120 units, 
uh, another fully connected layers of 84 units, and then a softmax of um, 10 outputs. So this was a classification problem of um, handwritten digits. So this was, I don't think this was the MNIST data set. I'm not sure if the MNIST data set existed back then, but this was handwritten notes that people had taken pictures of and they were trying to do basically classification. They were trying to figure out which digit is this from zero to nine. Um, I think they also did it for letters, like in, if you see here in this example. And here you see the, the network architecture of the original image, the, the different convolution filters, the max pooling, another convolution, another max pooling, and fully connected layers, uh, followed by the output. Um, this paper, I haven't fully read it, but uh, I used some other topics and um, methodologies that are not uh, used anymore. So, uh, but I just wanted to point it out that this was like one of those uh, seminal papers that um, brought up attention to a specific way of designing your, your deep learning model. And another thing to view is that number of parameters back then was 60,000 parameters. So if, if you do a you know, model of summary right now, if you use Lenin 5, you'd see 60,000 parameters. Then later on in 2012, there was another paper, uh, AlexNet, I think it was one of the winners for that year's image classification challenge I will see called ImageNet. That one was um, similar to the previous one, but it extended in, in, in a few ways. So again, it was fall. It was a combination of convolutional layers, max pooling, convolutional layers, max pooling, convolutional, 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 followed by max pooling, followed by three fully connected layers and a soft max of a thousand categories. So the, the classification challenge here had a thousand distinct categories. That's why you see the soft max of a thousand here. So it was similar to Linet, but much bigger. He used Relu as the uh, nonlinearity in, in convolutions. Uh, it was actually trained, this is the original diagram from the paper, it was actually trained on two GPUs, uh, simply because of resource restrictions. And um, uh, used some other concept that, um, that are not used anymore. Um, and the number of parameters, just to keep in mind, from 60K, we jump now to 60 million parameters. Uh, that was interesting. Then a couple of years later on, um, another network, uh, showed up of 2014 uh, called VGG16. It's actually one of a family of other networks. And that one had, again, convolutional max pooling, convolutional pooling, convolutional pooling, convolutional pooling. So you get the idea uh, of the image starting with the 224, 224, becoming smaller and smaller and smaller, but the number of channels that you use get larger and larger and larger. So you see here you use 64 filters, then you double them 128, then you double them 256, then you double them 512, and then you flatten them and use them in your fully connected layers. Uh, on the right here, you have different variations of this model. The one that um, I think won the competition was called, it was called VGG16 and had 138 million parameters. Another one in 2015 um, was it's called uh, Resin Residual Network. This was um, innovative in the sense that he used something called residual block. And if you remember from our conversation on deep learning, one of the main challenges of deep learning is uh, vanishing or exploding gradients when you train a network. Um, so this residual block was the first um, innovative idea towards um, solving for that challenge. And what is actually what we're actually doing in this simple example uh, is that if we have let's say two fully connected layers with just three units, uh, in a new, in a normal neural network you'd see the input going from left to right, and you'd be applying your your weights, your biases, and your nonlinear functions, let's say ReLU. So as you do that, when you do back propagation, the deeper the network gets, the more your weights become. Um, smaller or larger, depending on how the gradients explode or vanish. So that basically makes your network uh, underperform. So this idea of residual block is saying, um, is basically is trying to uh, learn the identity function, meaning that uh, in the end of the network, uh, the output should be able to learn the identity function, meaning whatever was the input, 
that should be the output. That's not trivial to us, but in deep learning models, that is not as trivial simply because you have so many layers that are fine tuned and, and learned as we train our model. And the difference here is that right before we apply nonlinearity, instead of applying the nonlinearity here in, in, in the input of the previous layer, we also add the input of two layers back. So in this case, this output here, AL plus two, would be a nonlinear combination of the previous layer, Andrew calls it C, plus the input two layers ago, AL. Then, sorry, um, this graph here on the left, on the upper part of it, um, shows error rate for a classical network, or what they call in the paper plane network. And as you see, the less layers you have, 20 layers, the lower the error rate. You'd imagine that the deeper the network, the lower the error rate. But in this case, you see that when you add more and more layers, you increase actually the error rate, simply because of this vanishing gradient and exploding gradients. Uh, challenge that we talked about. In their paper, though, you see that the reverse is happening. You see that when they use 20 layers, they have about a little bit less than 10% error rate. And as they add more and more layers, actually performance improves, which is what, what we want. So they started with a 20 layer network all the way to 110 layer network in, in dark here. And you see that error rate is dropping as, as training goes on. Then on the right here, um, it's kind of hard to see, but we have a 34 layer plane network, which is basically your image, uh, convolutional followed by um, max pooling when you see it divided by two, convolutional, 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 divided by two, max pool, convolutional, 128, max pool, and all that. What the, innovate, the, the new thing here is that we have those, what are called skip connections or residual blocks. So we propagate our input two layers back into basically forward layers so that we can avoid this uh, challenge that we described below, and also allowing the gradients basically to flow through this other channel, not just through these multiple channels that you see here. And another network that we'll see deeper or uh, in more detail is called um, an Inception Network. Uh, this was released in 2014. It was um, it was inspired by uh, a few other papers. Uh, one of them is uh, called Networking Network that uses something called a one by one convolution. Yeah. And, I would call it credit. And what that is, is basically a, a fully connected layer uh, that looks like a convolution, but it's actually a fully connected layer. Um, and that's one way of reducing, um, or I would say, changing your your depth of your uh, volume without affecting the, the size of it. So in this volume here, what, what, what is the motivation behind the Inception Network is that we start with, let's say, a 28 by 28 by 192 volume, and this could be the output of a previous layer. So the width is 28, the height is 28, and the depth or number of channels or features is 192. What the Inception uh, model does is it applies different um, filters of different sizes and also max pooling at the same time. So instead of us trying to figure out, okay, do we use uh, uh, three by three filters? Do we use five by five filters? Do we use you know, one by one filters? Do we use max pooling? And what's the right combination? In this paper, they said, let's combine them all. Let's do them all in parallel. Let's just make sure that the output is the same size, 28 by 28, so that we can stack them next to each other. So for example, if we do, uh, one by one convolution of 64 of them, you end up with this green volume here. That's 28, 28 by 64. Then if you do a three by three, something called same convolution, meaning the input and output have the same size. Let's say we do 128 of them filters. We're gonna end up with a 28 by 28 by 128. And if we keep doing this for different filters of different um, sizes, as long as the output is, uh, is 28 by 28 by something, we just stack that something next to each other and come up with another volume. So in this example, we started with a 28 by 28 by 192, and we ended up with a 28 by 28 by 256 
uh, just a number that adds up of 64, 128, 32, and 32. George, do they say how they handle the border issue? Do they repeat the yeah. edge pixels? Um, the paper, I, they didn't say same. So same means that, yeah, you need to do padding here. Uh, usually when you do padding, you do zeros. Um, but I don't remember a specific mm -hmm. out okay. of board rate, yeah. And then this same diagram, uh, if you see here, it's similar. Uh, it's just how it's mentioned in the paper. So you have the previous layer output. You do a one wire on convolution, a three by three, a five by five, or a max pooling. And then you concatenate all these filters, all these outputs into uh, one unit. Another version of this, which they use is um, they, they use this one by one convolution simply because they want to reduce this 182 number to something more manageable. As they say in the paper, they don't want this to explode in terms of number of parameters. So they reduce it first and then they apply the three by three convolution or five by five convolutions. So the larger the filter size, the, the more parameters you're gonna see. That's why they're doing this reduction in channels first and then applying the expensive, what they call in the paper, three by three or five by five convolutions. Then part of the, this larger model on the, uh, model on the right, part of it is this model here, which is again, similar to what we've seen so far, but we have basically the previous layer, uh, just to reduce the number of channels, we do this on one one convolutional operation. Uh, S here means same convolution. Then we do a three by three, we do directly one by one, one by one followed by five by five, the max pooling, reduce the number of channels, and then we concatenate them, and that would be the input to the next layer. Then the whole diagram, what they call, uh, Google Lenet, they pay actually homage to the Lenet architecture that we saw uh, in the very beginning from 1998. Uh, starts from here, you have the image, you have different, um, maybe I can zoom in here. Yeah. So you start with the image, you have different layers, convolutional max pooling, convolutional max pooling, then we have this, um, this uh, inception block of that we saw before of convolutional one by one followed by three by three or five by five that becomes the next output. That's one. That's one um, inception layer. Even though in reality, as you see here, it's it's it's, it's two. Then another layer. Then another layer. Then another layer. All of them. All of them. If you add them up according to the paper, it's twenty two. But if you count the in between ones, probably that's more than that. Another innovative uh, feature that this paper had is, was, so the final output was a softmax here of the thousand classes for ImageNet for 2014. What they actually did was, uh, was to introduce what are called uh, side networks that you see here. And these are basically, think of them as branches uh, that the, that are pulling features from intermediate layers instead of all the waiting till the end. They're pulling features from the intermediate layers, doing their own uh, downsizing and fully connected, fully connected and soft max. So the idea was that you don't need to wait till the 20 second layer to do actually a soft max classification. Intermediate layers have a lot of rich information that you can use, intermediate representations. So that's what they're doing during, during training. They're, um, they're plugging in this intermediate uh, classifiers here, two of them in this case, in earlier models. So this side networks are actually used during um, training and they contribute to the loss of the entire network um, uh, multiplied by weight of, I think, 0.3. And basically these are, think of them as three in parallel classification problems they're trying to solve, but each one of them has access to different layers of the network. One of them has access to layer on, Represent, early on representations of your model. The next one has access to deep representations and the last one has access to the even deeper representations. And but do you recall they, they're classifying the same labels? Yes, yes okay. they're classifying the exact same labels, a uh, thousand categories in this case, and the loss function just gets added up to the main loss function. Yeah. yeah. And during inference, you get rid of them, you don't need them anymore. You just do things during training.
cool. Um, I have a link here to this paper. This was an interesting collection of different networks uh, and how they look like in terms of accuracy and in terms of complexity. Um, there's, so they, they start with AlexNet. There's a few variations of it. There's some other ones that I am, I'm not aware of. I haven't read them yet. But you see that um, you know, as they progress, uh, the accuracy gets better and better. So it started with 50% accuracy. Um, and I don't think the, the data set was the same for all of them, but let's say for a typical classification problem, we started from the 50s and now all the way to like 80s and 90s, probably higher than that. And the color here, if you see, for example, ResNet, the residual network, if, if they have the same color, that means they're part of the same family, same with the BGG and same with the inception network. And this diagram here on the right has two axes. One of them is accuracy again, what they call top one accuracy, and we'll see what that means. And the x-axis is how many operations um, does the whole model include? And I think that's a combination of how many uh, multiplications do you have to do for one image to traverse the whole network from beginning to end. And that's in um, you know, millions of them. Or billions. And Do you know if that operations computation is forward plus backward, or just one of those? I think this is only forward. I think only forward. Um, I, I I haven't fully read the paper. I just took a, a quick look. i um, I think from what I've seen, it's just a forward, but I could be wrong. And then the size is the number of parameters. So there's actually a three-dimensional graph. Um, so this, this size is 5 million parameters all the way to 150 million. And let's say, so ResNet, a version of it was around here, had five um, you know, billion operations and 70% accuracy with somewhere between five and 35 million parameters. Kind of hard to tell from the size. Um, you see Inception, ResNet, different versions of Inception and different version of VGG. It's interesting to see the different VGG ones. They're very similar in number of parameters, right? Size, and also operations and, and accuracy. That, so that's, it's like an architectural uh, design. So I'm admitting one more person. So, so one of the models we'll be looking at today is called Inception version three. It's actually a third version of the paper that we saw. So this is on the model side. Before we um, talk about uh, training and how does it do, let's talk about the data part of it. So the data part of it is, uh, we'll be talking about this data set called ImageNet. It started in 2006 by Fei Fei Li. I think she was an assistant professor in Princeton when she wanted to make, um, she wanted to focus on the data part of it back then. Uh, a lot of researchers were focused on how do I make my model you know, perform better? What innovation do I have to do there? Is it a new uh, feature I have to add? Is it more fine tuning? Is it, do I have to go deeper or wider? So more researchers were focused on the model side, but as you know by now, deep learning is a combination of data and model. So she started creating this data set back then in 2006 in collaboration with other researchers as well. I think it was based off on another uh, word or NLP model or data set called WordNet. It had different hierarchies um, that back then were, were interesting, more of, more of it like, uh, like a Wikipedia, I would say, uh, but not as, as big as Wikipedia hierarchy. Um, so she wanted to do the image version of that, meaning she, uh, she wanted to pull together labeled data for let's say plants, natural object, geograph ge geological formation, sports, artifacts, and all that. And I think when, when they started doing that, they had um, about a million images and they had a thousand different categories. At least that was the case for 2014. This data set now, it's much, much bigger. It had 14 million images right now and about 21 different thousand categories. But if you do a search for, let's say, in this case, where we'll do a cat and dog classification, if you do a search for cat, you'll see so many variations of different cats by, by breed. So even for us humans, it might be a little bit tricky to, to tell the difference between different breeds. So imagine 
for a deep neural network, similar for dogs, you know, like Husky or Eskimo dog, it's actually a different breed. And it counts as a different category, one of these thousand categories. Um, so this data set had a thousand images, as I mentioned. Um, um, it had 50,000 images for validation and 100,000 images for testing. And each one of them was, was associated with what is called a, a, a ground truth category. And then if your model, uh, what is called top prediction, meaning your softmax, if you look at the highest scoring one, was uh, the same as the ground truth, then it counted towards your top one accuracy rate. But if you provided to this competition the, your five um, highest uh, outputs, and if the ground truth was one of those five, regardless of the order, then you'd count towards that top five um, accuracy rate or error rate. And that the, the papers that we saw, I think were mainly interested in this top five. Uh, so as long as basically your prediction is, your top five predictions contain the ground truth, your output count as a valid one. Uh, here I'm showing the image and competition results over time. And you'll see in the beginning 20, 2011, the error rate was, uh, you know, 0.5, meaning 50% of them were right, 50% were wrong. And as you see over time, the error rate went down to 30% or the accuracy went to 70%, 80%, 90%, 90, 95, 99 plus. So you see the accuracy increasing and the error rate decreasing basically over time. <coughs> so if you don't mind muting yourselves, uh, uh, Anwar, I, for some reason, oh, sorry. I'm not able to mute you. Thank you. Cool. So how do we do this now in, in TensorFlow? So we saw the model part, we saw the data set part. Uh, how do we actually make it work in code? Uh, we're gonna need a few libraries for that. We're gonna need the, from Keras, we're gonna need the layers um, library as well as the model um, uh, library or module. Then we're gonna need the pre-trained model. We're gonna need basically the weights for a specific model. And in this case, this URL contain, contains the weights for this inception version three model that we saw before. So that's the weights part. And that would correspond to the 20 plus million parameters that we saw before. Um, the other thing we're gonna need is actually the structure of the model. <clears throat> As you've seen before, when we have a, co a collection of layers in a sequential uh, module, we need actually that structure. And that structure is actually implemented in Keras under TensorFlow Keras application in section version three. So we have the model, we have the weights. How do we actually make it work? Well, we have to instantiate our model. We have to call this inception version three. We have to specify our input size for images. And in this case, we'll do this. We'll use the same data set that we used before the cat and dogs data set that Lawrence uses. Uh, we expect the inputs to be 150 by 150 by three. Um, if you remember, this inception model has fully connected, fully connected, and a soft max layer at the very end. This include top equals false means that please do not include that last layer, that fully connected last layer. And weights none, meaning don't use any, any standard weights that your model comes with because we will load our weights based on these uh, weights that we just downloaded. And how do we do that? So we created our pre trained model with this uh, command line here. There's a method called load weights in, in TensorFlow that if you pass in as a parameter the actual file that contains the, um, the weights. Um, yep, right here, so this H5. This is a, this is a scientific um, um, a library that contains um, multidimensional data. This, uh, I forgot the, what it stands for. So, we load the weights, and now our model has both the structure as well as the, the weights. Then the other thing we need to do to actually implement transfer learning is go through each one of the layers. So this for loop here for layer in pre-trained model.layers. We'll go and iterate through each one of the layers 
and it will set layer dot trainable equal false, meaning when we train our network, uh, gradient descent won't change any of our weights. Our weights will be frozen and gradient descent will, up, will not update them. And the next thing we can do is, uh, if we look at the summary here on the right, we have to pick now where do we take the output of this network and add our own network. So you can do it at the very end, you can do it somewhere in the middle, as you saw with the intermediate classifiers. You can go as, as you know, as far as you want. I've, I've tried experimenting with this with a few different layers. I went all the way in the beginning, at the top of the of the network, then down, down, down. Um, it depends, I guess, on the on the challenge. I noticed when I'm right in the end, I didn't get the the highest accuracy when I went a few layers deeper or closer or inside the network, I got actually slightly better uh, performance. So in this case, we, the layers have a name and we'll be using one called mix seven. And that is a seven by seven by 768 layer. So what that means is our model will take our image and it will output a seven by seven by 768 layer. It has multiple layers under it. It has a, probably a mixed eight, mixed nine, has multiple layers. We'll completely ignore them. I will just basically attach our network after at this mix seven entry point and start building from that. So if you look at the shape of it, it's seven by seven by 768, as you see here and here. Then, then we start basically our deep learning uh, setup, which is basically defining our own network. But in this case, the input is not an image. The input is actually this last output that we took from pre-trained model dot get layer and the layer name. So we take that output, we flatten it. Uh, we use our own fully connected layer of 1,024 neurons or units. We apply a rail activation. So when we flatten it, we store the output in this variable X. Then we pass the, we call this, when we call this dense layer, we actually give it as input X. So you see here the syntax is slightly different than we've seen before. And if you're doing PyTorch, you'll see that this is very common to PyTorch. Then this X means pass it as input to this function or layer and store the new output in the same variable X. Then take the output X, pass it through a dropout rate of 20%. So 20% of the nodes and connections between this layer and the last layer will be dropped randomly each time we train it. And the last layer is just one uh, dense layer of one unit because we only have two classes and it's using a sigmoid function. So it's basically a, a binary classification problem. So we have our X. Then the last thing we need to do is call our model uh, constructor here. We have to give it as input the pre-trained model input. That's what the model would expect. And uh, the output would be X. And if you remember, X is a collection of the last output of the pre-trained layer followed by our own network. So our own network is basically this dense dropout dense. Then as usual, we need to compile this. We, we specify our optimizer, um, RMS prop in this case with a small learning rate. This is a binary classification problem. So we use a binary cross entropy loss function. And this is just for output as, as we saw last time that we want to output accuracy as we train this. So that was defining the network. I have an image here of 21 million parameters that we talked about. And this is the original model. We didn't go all the way to mix 10. We stopped at mix seven and we constructed our network on top of mix seven and completely ignored this part. Then with fit this, we have our training generator, uh, our validation generator. And we, we trained this for 20 epochs and if you remember from week two, uh, for this data set, the accuracy was about 70s, 80s. Um, so right now the accuracy, the training accuracy goes 90 plus, 94, 95%. And the validation accuracy is much more stable. We don't see that divergence that we used to see before. Um, if you look at the loss function, same, same as here, the training loss keeps decreasing for 20 epochs here and the validation loss also, it's very stable. Hey, George, um, just, just to be clear, if, instead of calling the pre-trained model summary, if you called the model summary, you would have seen the trainable and you would have seen non-trainable 
parameters at the end, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The okay. sums that you're seeing are, are from the pre-trained model, like before I changed it, before I hooked up our, our network at the mix seven layer. And right, and that's just showing that we we froze all the layers in the pre-trained model. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other questions? This was a lot of content. Um, but we went basically from 80s, 70, 80 accuracy, percent accuracy to 96, 95% accuracy using this much more complex model. And our network now contains this complex model with just our three layers of dense, dropout dense in the end. What are the main things we attribute the improvement to? Is it the, so if you use, if you use the image net, you know, the, the net that you've trained on this large data set, then you've used a lot of data. Mm -hmm. And then so your, is it, so your lower level features are more, um, predictive or useful than what came before because we use less data? Yep. So the original data set of cats and dogs was, <clears throat> I think 2000 images for training and a thousand for testing. So we have basically 3000 images. ImageNet had over a million. Uh, not all of them were cats and dogs, just to clarify, right? So I, I'm pretty sure they had more than 3,000 images of cats and dogs. So yeah, absolutely. One of them is more data and also the variations, right? So it's not just, it's realistic pictures of cats and dogs. So it, different poses, different colors, different backgrounds, and you know, different variations of it. I'm sorry, what were you talking about? That what ImageNet has cats and dogs plus a lot of other things. And then, yep. and then yeah, a lot of other things, but cats and dogs in different poses, different variations. It's a much richer right. data set than our original one, basically. Yeah, um, okay. So for sure that had, you know, had a Well, I, I, I guess it kind, of, it kind of gets back to Kathleen's question. I, I was sort of on the impression too that, um, especially this one, you know, this ImageNet data set, you could, the, the, the idea was that it, it was so big and diverse that you were you were picking up a lot of um lower level features mm -hmm. and so it didn't matter that much what the specific content was it didn't matter you know you and and so you wouldn't be limited to going from trucks to delivery trucks in this case because you'd had more you have more than trucks here you yeah. know you have a whole lot of things so you might be able to go you know, from whatever to training on your sort of s more specific thing, mm -hmm. whatever it was, um, maybe a bunch of animals yeah, or, uh, you know, something like that. And, and then you could, and, and then maybe you could go to trucks um, using the same data set and um, predict that. Mm -hmm. So, I thought that was kind of the idea, the notion that you could use, you know, could use it for different things. Yeah, I, I thought the, um, the idea of the transfer learning versus just a, a model that has got good generalization um, characteristics is that you could do it, what Martin was just saying, that could go beyond what, you, what the training set was. I mean, I think the key, the, the key being that you've sharpened up those earlier uh, feature, you know, feature layers that, um, you know, you're, 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 the things that detect edges and the things that detect squares and, you know, whatever they detect, it's stuff like that, but they hadn't quite worked their way up yet to specific mm -hmm. things like dogs, which you get to in the later layer. Yeah, my only input would be that if, if you take this pre-trained model and your problem domain is completely different, let's say you want to build a, a deep learning model that recognizes music notes and somehow you want to play them, you know, 
or or just classify them or detect them. If if this data set had never seen music notes, you know, Western notation music notes, um, I don't know how well it would do. I don't expect it to do well at all, simply because it's a completely different uh, background. It's a completely different data set. It's a completely different you know data distribution that this your model has has never seen. That's that, that was my point. So can I ask a question for clarification real quick? Yeah. Uh, so the way I was thinking of it probably is that um, it doesn't matter as much if it's seen your specific type of thing, but that it's if it's seen things with the same um, kind of defining characteristics. So for example, um, maybe if you've trained it on a whole bunch of cats and dogs and things, and now you're trying to identify squirrels. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe it hasn't seen squirrels, but the identifying feature of a squirrel may be the fuzzy tail. Yeah. And well, it's because it's seen a lot of cat of different varieties of cats and dogs, it's triggered in on, hey, this kind of fuzziness could be a defining trait. So it's kind of amplified that trait. Where if you just trained on like buildings, maybe you could kind of go from buildings to trucks because it's finding like sharp edges and different directions and stuff but it probably wouldn't be good at finding things based on whether they're mottled or fuzzy or round or that type of thing. Um, I don't know if this, that was kind of how I was assuming it sort of worked on transferring characteristics and traits from one thing to another. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I was thinking as well. Curious if anybody okay. has used, yeah. Um, so I, I, I use transfer and learning a lot for imagery and one of the things I would pose to you is that the further your, you know, objects you're trying to classify are from the corpus of data that the, the original network was trained on, as you get further from it, you're going to have to get to good results. You're going to have to unfreeze more layers from the original model mm -hmm. because the things it's learned, you know, later on the higher or uh, specific features are no longer valid in your new domain. Got it. Um, but of course, one of the reasons we want to use transfer learning is twofold is it's the original models probably been exposed to a really useful big data set that we wouldn't have access to or, or number two, we don't have the computational resources to train the model to get the weights where we want them to. Mm -hmm. So if you get further away from the domain it was trained on, you're going to end up training most of the model anyway, and that's going to defeat the purpose of trying to use transfer learning. So at some point, there's a balance where transfer learning doesn't help you anymore, right? Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, that's a good point. Yep. Here, here was quite easy. You were looking at cats and dogs, which are in the, in the area, so you only had to unfreeze to or replace the top layer, right? You didn't, you froze everything else and it works very well, 90% yeah. or something, right? Yeah, it actually went three layers deep. I didn't do the last one, I did the, the third from the bottom, yeah. But. Oh, you did, okay, yeah. David, David, what, um, what other uh, data sets, training sets have you used, um, transferred from? Uh, face, you know, face recognition is one that's very, you know there's very good models out there to do it so and it would take you a long long time to train your own model to be as uh -huh. good um but you know you would be you can use them in a lot of different ways that they weren't originally used but they're mm -hmm. very good at picking out facial uh features and, and applying them um there's a also uh natural language processing is another big huge place where you can use it there's so many large models like BERT and all these ones that are coming out now that you could never run them unless you were using transfer learning. Um, so David, you, you, you have, a, um, you said you, the, the, how should you say it? The, the original database would be just a massive database of, of facial recognition. Is that the kind of it? And then, but then when you would transfer to something else, what would the something else be? More faces? That, so that, that in, this case, in this case, it might be specific type of faces. I, I don't want to give away too much, but yeah, it's like, you know, there's certain, certain uh, attributes of a face that you might be looking for 
Okay. The original model's not looking for, but it's picked out useful features to you, and it's and it's looked at a huge number of of images that you don't have access to. So that, that's you know, they're getting two things that that big amount of data that's been trained on, and also the compute time that someone has been using to train on that data that usually you don't have access to, right? So. So, so David, you used a um, a model trained on faces, um, and and used it for facial recognition, for a, face, a facial task. Yes. Okay. The uh, everything I'll point out is there's a um, so George here. It's using Kerasat applications, which has some of the classic, you know, uh, transfer learning models. But there's a TensorFlow hub, which is also part of TensorFlow, and another way to bring mm -hmm. a lot of these pre-trained models in, especially the newer, you know, NLP ones and such. Um, so it's a it's a bigger resource of a lot of pre-trained models with the weights and and the models. You can just look up TensorFlow hub. It's I think it's like thub.dev is the URL. I can put it in the cool. I'll put it in the chat. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, that's part of the next specialization, right? Data and deployment, if I remember correctly. Yeah, he, he doesn't go over it in here, but yeah. it's a great, cool. it's a big, big repository of uh, transfer learning models, return models. Awesome. Any other questions before we go to week four and multi class classification? Cool. Okay, let me. Robert, would you like me to give you a control or you want me to just click for you? Uh, why don't you just continue to drive? It's only a few slides. It'll be pretty short and sweet. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Go for it. Sure. So as you know, week four of course two is on multi-class classifications. So they're, they present it here as if it's new to the course, which I guess it is new to course two, but we did multi-class problems in course one with the MNIST data set as well as the fashion MNIST data set. Each of those had 10 classes, digits from zero to nine, and 10 different items, articles of clothing. So in this particular one, this week, Lawrence has shared with us his rock, paper, scissors data set. And this one's kind of cool because it was all virtually generated through CGI. And Lawrence and Andrew and the conversation at the beginning of week four, they, they talk about this. And it's, there, there's a number of reasons why you might want to use CGI or you know some other synthetic or some other means to synthesize your imagery. So a Andrew in the conversation does say that you know this used to be considered a highly suspect and fishy technique but uh, now it's gained more acceptance in recent years as people have shown it to work. He doesn't give any numbers or, or evidence for that. It, no, nobody talks about that specifically that I recall. But it is uh, quite clear that many of the the hands that, that are generated in this particular database or data set do look, you know, fairly fairly lifelike. So <laughs> so one of the reasons and another one of the reasons that you would want to generate your data set like this is to create far more variety than you could with real hands. You would need a large number of different models to get hands with such a different variety of skin tones. And you'd have to have them posed in various ways. And it would just basically be expensive to create this data set. Whereas Lawrence was able to generate it all himself through code. The set of directories shown in the upper left is just shows how one might use a flow from directory method on the image data generator. You might set up your 
items in rock, paper, scissors, directories, uh, training and validation. This is, this is the way it is done for the, the uh, example that Lawrence walks through. So another one of the aspects that is new to multi-class classification, or at least differentiates it from binary classification, is that now there are now there is more than one way to make an error given a particular type of truth value in the image. So if you look at the hands with the purple nails in the upper right on this slide, this is a person who is doing the paper symbol, but it you, you see the, maybe it's just the angle that her hand is being waved at, but there does appear to be a gap between her index and middle fingers there, which makes it appear a little bit similar to some of the scissors images, images possible, like the one in the, in the lower right of this slide. So it is not terribly surprising that a model might predict that this is paper with 65% probability and that there's a high probability that you might accidentally call it scissors. It's very clear that it's not rock. So you might generate an entire contingency table, otherwise known as a confusion matrix for data like this. And it can be interesting to probe the different types of misclassifications. We don't do that at all in the course this week though. So the only other thing I was gonna mention about this particular data set is it's somewhat small. It's 2,892 images and that includes 25, I think it's 2,520 in the training subdirectory, 840 of each. 840 rocks, 840 papers, 840 scissors, and a validation directory has 124 of each of those items. So in order to do multi-class classification, one needs to make a variety of changes in the code. First of all, when defining your generators, train generator and validation generator. We used class mode equals binary for the previous tasks such as cats versus dogs and horses versus humans. Now we should change that to categorical because we have more than two classes. Another change that needs to be made is that when we define our model, we should change the last layer. The last layer, we recall that we previously used sigmoid function, which only needed one neuron on the end. And through that one neuron, you could use an activation sigmoid and the, that would give you a function that asymptotes either to one or to zero, depending on whether the input Z is positive or negative and you could use that to make a two-class classification. You can't use a function like that if your objective is to classify into three or more classes. So the standard approach here is to use the softmax, which is similar to the sigmoid in the sense that it uh, has a functional form with uh, exponentials, and but you're basically just uh, converting you're, it's as if you're applying a sigmoid three separate times and then summing those so that you're normalizing them so that the sum of the three adds to one. Another change that you have to make is when you compile your model, the binary cross entropy function is no longer a good choice for categorical data. So, you could use the categorical cross entropy function if your data have been one hot encoded, such as the data set in the rock, paper, scissors. However, you might run into data sets where the classes are represented by integers 
and you don't need to one hot encode them to run a TensorFlow model on them. There's a separate loss function that is able to deal with that, and it's called sparse categorical cross entropy, where it just allows you to represent your classes as integers. You do have to be careful when using any of these categorical cross entropy functions that your class definitions in your training validation and test sets are consistent with one another. You know, that the same number or the same one hot encoded vector has to represent the same original class. This can be a concern if you're using certain certain subfunctions such as uh, I think pandas get dummies for instance can convert categorical arrays into one hot encoded but if it you know if if your test set happens to not have one of the classes that your training set had it might give it different numbers and you get different vectors out and it it could just be could be a problem this is something that is worth considering when doing the graded exercise for this week, which is the sign language data set that I'll, that'll describe a little bit later. So then we get a plot of uh, what Lawrence obtains for his training accuracy, which is the red line, and validation accuracy is kind of uh, bouncing around quite a bit. Now, I don't know uh, what, what your experiences were, but when I ran the model in CoLab, I got a similar trajectory, but it was much slower and not as good a performance as he got. I think mine oh, after 25 epochs was only around 80% accuracy training. Validation was quite a bit higher, I think. Interesting. Can we go on? Okay. So that leads us to the exercise, the graded exercise for the week. The, it uses the sign language MNIST data set. This is, so one of the reasons that we had to worry about how many ind individual classes you have in a data set is that there are 26 letters in the English alphabet, but the sign language MNIST data set only contains 24 letters. And the reason for that is that there are two letters that require motion, right? If you want to, if you want to sign the letter J, it, you use, you make the symbol for I, but then you, you kind of uh, do, do this little, maybe, maybe I should, I'm assuming that the camera probably Puts yeah. me puts me backwards. That was pretty good. Uh, does that <laughs> actually work? <laughs> what about Z? And then Z, I think you don't even. I think you just kind of point and do that, right? Yeah. Okay. Pretty cool. So for this particular database or data set, they have it integer encoded, which means that A is zero, B is is one, C is two, and it's given in a single integer vector j would be nine and you find that there are no nines in the data set so it just skips that k is 10 l is 11 etc so you do have to be careful when deciding how many classes you want to or how many how many uh neurons that are in the softmax layer at the end to uh, to deal with this issue so the sign language MNIST is, I, it was, I believe it was uploaded to Kaggle three years ago. I didn't see a whole lot of information about where exactly that came from. At the time, they were motivating it by the observation that a robust sign language detector could significantly improve the experience of deaf people when trying to communicate online, they could use computer vision to, to uh, translate much like uh, 
much like hearing people are able to do with speech recognition. So in the three years since, I guess there have been a, a couple of uh, a couple of efforts in that regard that seem like they've uh, they've had some success. I don't know the details of those. This particular data set uploaded to Kaggle, there are 27,000 training images and 7,000 test images. So it's about half the size of the original MNIST's handwritten and, and or the fashion set for that matter. Interesting, yeah. Um, thanks, Robert. One of the challenges, I guess, is if this data set contains you know, the same hand same light exposure, the same background, or different combinations, so that if you actually try to do it on your own, you don't run into the issue of your model picking features from the background or from your specific, you know, color tone or whatever you're wearing. Right. Cool. Thank you. That was very useful. Thank you, Robert. So that concludes uh, week four of course two. Um, we have three more error slides if you, uh, if you have the energy and the will to uh, finish them with us. Um, but before we wrap up course two and we move to NLP, natural language processing, um, in our next course, I just wanted to mention a few more topics that I think are important. So they have to do with overfitting and how do you overcome overfitting. And uh, last time, David talked about data augmentation and how do we use that to uh, fight overfitting? We also talked about dropout. There are, minor, there are a few more techniques that you can use to uh, avoid overfitting, and uh, I just want to briefly mention them here. So the screenshot that you see here is, is from Andrew's uh, lecture on, on regression and a new technique called regular, regularization. And what that basically does is um, when we define our loss function, which is a, our cost function, which is a combination of our uh, of our loss function. Um, one, of the one of the issues that we've seen is that our model is fine tuning or picking specific features from the input. And what that translates, what does that translate to is that different weights um, become much larger and most of the weights become much smaller in our network. If we want to apply regularization in our model, what we do is we actually penalize large weights. So we add a what is called a, a regularization parameter lambda. And we take uh, a norm, we take a, a, a size basically function of our weights that penalizes, that gets added up to our uh, cost function. Um, you can also penalize you know, large biases as well since these are trainable parameters as well, but uh, usually um, now you only add uh, this lambda parameter to the weights. There are different um, regularization methods you can use. You can use the, the what is called an L2, which is basically uh, the square, the sum square of your weight. If this is a vector, um, it's, it's defined similarly or slightly different for uh, a matrix. Then if it's an L1, you're just interested in the actual magnitude of them, the absolute value of your weights. And uh, the reason why you want to do that is that now we have another hyperparameter to tune, this lambda. But basically, the higher you set that up, uh, the more this impacting or uh, uh, this side of the cost function will, will be. So that will drive your weights lower. So that's the, the side effect. And the intuition behind that is that if your weight is too small or too large, depending on what activation function you're using in your intermediate layers, but let's say you're using a uh, a 10 H activation function that goes between minus one and one. If your weight is too small or too large, you, you will end up either in the um, uh, plus one or negative one saturated areas of this activation function. And by carefully fine tuning this lambda and lowering your, your, uh, the size of your weights, you will end up in this linear part of this activation function and have basically a bit more flexibility in terms of gradient. So the gradient here is well defined compared to uh, the gradients in the saturated areas of the tan H where they're almost zero. So that will allow your gradient descent to work a little bit faster, a little bit better, and that will basically try to uh, not overfit your data. As you see here, you have some O's and X's 
instead of trying to come up with a very complex model that 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 is trying to um, classify them with 100% accuracy, you, maybe you can just classify them with a much simpler model that has smaller accuracy, but it, it's not overfitting, meaning when you try it in the test set, you achieve a decent result. And the way you do that in TensorFlow is you import these uh, module core regularizers from TensorFlow Keras. And when you add your different layers, in this case, a dense network with a specific activation function, you add something called a kernel regularizer. And there are different ones. You can have an L2 or an L1, as we mentioned. And this parameter that you see here is, is an initial value, I think, for this lambda parameter that later on fits. Uh, yeah, so that's your hyperparameter that you, that you set like similar to what we do with learning rate, for example. You can do that in all your layers or just one. Um, it's a good idea usually to do it in, in all your layers. And here on the right, um, there's a tutorial in Keras that it's, I found that very useful, that looks at a small model of about 500 parameters that's called tiny and that's in blue. And you see the blue, uh, solid blue is the training um, in this case, this is binary cross entropy, the y value, similar to loss. Uh, we can consider it as our loss in, in our case. And the x axis is iterations or epochs. So if you see with the, the small network without any regularization, we see that the loss is slowly dropping, 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 but it's in the beginning, it's a little bit high. When you add L2 regularization to this network, you see that the loss function significantly drops. And uh, your validation then after that kind of uh, trends. But you see the difference here, that's simply by introducing a regularization uh, effect. That's one method. Another one is batch normalization that has to do with the data distribution. So in this very simple example, we just have one unit, one neuron, and our inputs are three features, and we're just trying to classify or output one number. Uh, we want to make sure that our uh, inputs uh, have, um, we remove the mean and we divide by the standard deviation so that they are pretty well defined, meaning when we do gradient descent, um, the, they don't have different scales, so they don't have different magnitudes that will cause our learning process to, uh, to become a little bit slower. You can do this for your inputs. You can also do it for the intermediate outputs of each uh, layer. Uh, so you can introduce normalization at, at each layer, basically. And then you do that with TFKS layer batch normalization in, in TensorFlow. Then another one, um, so yeah, that was it. Um, this tutorial uh, also mentions a few other ones. Um, one of them is called capacity of the network, basically how large your network is. And in this graph, in this graph here, we have the same tiny train, training set and tiny model. The tiny one has about, yeah, 500 um, parameters in blue. Then the small one has about 700 in yellow and you see it's very well defined. It's not diverging the loss function. Then when we go to a medium sized network over about 10,000 parameters, and that's basically the more and more dense layers. Our, our model is basically deeper. With this 10K, we achieve smaller loss until about um, 50 epochs, 20, 30. This is log scale in terms of epochs. And then after that, the, um, the, the validation just takes off. Uh, so you see the green one, that's the medium one. It just diverges from training the solid one to validation, the dotted one. Same for the large one. Large one has 800,000 parameters. And as you see, the red one is also diverging. So by introducing L2 regularization, you see that it's uh, defined. By introducing dropout as well in, in brown, it's also much better. And then when you combine L2 and dropout, you see this curve here that's again, well, much better defined and it's not uh, diverging. And these charts were taken from this Higgs data set that's available in this uh, training uh, tutorial on Keras at uh, 11 million parameters and 28 features and one binary class. I think it's a, it, so it's a physics uh, problem. I'm not sure what the binary class, maybe, maybe one of the 
particles exist or not. Um, Probably, yeah, detection. Yeah. So um, the question here, George, uh, it's, I've always seen this and it's like, um, yeah, you introduce each of these and some of them get you in, in a less number of epics, you can get go further before the, you know, you can get to a better value fast, less epics before you start to diverge between validation and training. But what they don't show is, and I know this for a fact, is that long? the epics are not the same times. It doesn't take the same time, right? So the more of these you add, the, the longer your epics take. Mm -hmm. And I, I wondered if you've ever seen any discussion of that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that'd be interesting to see how does duration of each epoch change as well. Obviously, yeah, when you combine them, I would expect it would take longer. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good point. Um, then some other ways that we've seen, uh, just to summarize, how do you, uh, com how do you fight overfitting and uh, how do you deal with it? So one, one solution would be to get more training data. Um, another one is reducing the capacity of the network, meaning you don't have to start with this huge network uh, on a small data set because what basically will happen is your large network will overfit your data. Another one is to add weight regularization like we saw L1 and L2. And another one is to uh, add dropouts. Um, we saw data augmentation that David covered last time and batch normalization where you normalize the intermediate outputs of each layer. Um, this well, website that you shared, Robert, with us also has a few more. Um, one of them I think we talked about last time briefly injecting noise. I haven't checked it out yet. Another one is called early stopping. We've seen that from the beginning where you can define a callback in TensorFlow and you can specify a specific threshold value for either the accuracy or the loss function in your uh, validation set that when your model reaches that, you can stop training so that you can basically here, we would stop at 180, 170 epochs. So you avoid this divergent uh, process. Another one is assembling where you basically, instead of having one or two or one model, you define multiple models and you take somehow uh, the average of those outputs of these models and you combine them into one output. And I think several of the papers or several of the classical architectures, that's what they do, especially the inception one. They had an ensemble model for, for the competition where they didn't just use one version of their model, they use different versions. They fine tune it, they hyperparameter tune different metrics and they, they, they look at the output of multiple, um, multiple models. They look at all the outputs, they took the average and then they took the soft max. So they would uh, classify that accordingly. Uh, talk about noise, L1 and L2. These are the main um, uh, techniques that I am aware of overfitting, of avoiding overfitting in neural networks. Curious if, if you've seen other ones or if you've used any of them, what is your feedback? I think that's, that's my last slide. Cool, thank you, Kathleen. <clears throat> Awesome. Okay, then that concludes our week uh, three and four for course two. Um, these are the same slides that I showed last time. I, I didn't know anything else. There's some interesting meetups that happened last week. Uh, Firaf uh, has have a meetup tomorrow, right, Firaf? On, I think. Um, That's correct. Meet up tomorrow, and it's about making a spell check. Huh? Spell check using using yeah. app. Interesting. Yeah, um, then our next session is May 15th. Um, there won't be any slides, it will just be an informal session. It, it, it's meant to be more like an open discussion. Um, based on the feedback that I received that day, I'm, I'm open to, uh, to doing the trivia as well. Um, but the trivia is a deep learning trivia for you who haven't heard it before. It contains questions on different topics that we covered for this course for the last uh, four weeks. Um, you can practice on it. You, the questions will be out of order. When um, we take it next week, it will be in a specific order. Um, that's that's all I have. Cool. So if there are no questions, thanks everyone for coming. Uh,